Hi, I'm Adam Silverman, Chief Medical Officer at Syllable and host of Syllable's new podcast, Can Silicon Valley Save Healthcare?, where we explore the intersection amongst health, health care, health tech, and investing. This first episode features Esther Dyson, who I consider to be a rock star in what I would call social investing. Esther doesn't just think great thoughts. She actually creates the milieu that catalyzes action something that I think is really missing in innovation, particularly in healthcare these days. You will see that Esther is very easy to talk to and even easier to listen to. So I hope you will like this episode. And if you do, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. So as, as I was saying, you were the catalyst for this because you introduced me to Cobus back in 2018. Right. And... Um, I remember I said to you, actually, I was having drinks with Rick Brush, and I said to Rick, I'm thinking about doing something different. Can I send you my resume? And, you know, if you think there's somebody that's worth me talking to, can you introduce me? And he goes, well, I'm happy to do that, but have you talked to Esther? And I was like, you know, I, I no, I haven't. I didn't feel like I wanted to impress upon her. You know, she's busy and I had plenty of excuses. And he said, stop it. He said, just send her an email with your resume and see what happens. And like 30 minutes after I sent you my CV, you called me and you said, I think I can do two good um, deeds with one introduction. And I said, what's that? And you said, I intru- I, I've invested in a healthcare company in Silicon Valley that has no healthcare experience. And I said, hold it. I said, you invested your, your own hard-earned money in a company that's in an industry for which they have no experience. And, and you said, sort of, welcome to Silicon Valley. So that started my journey as a 30-year physician, physician executive, healthcare leader into moving to something that was completely different for me. And... Last fall, I got an opportunity to give grand rounds at my old hospital, St. Francis in Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think about how do I tell my story in a way that would be not just so sort of autobiographical, but how could I help clinicians, physicians understand sort of what was going on in the in the milieu around them. And so I came up with this catchy title of Can Silicon Valley Save Healthcare? And it's a little cheeky. I mean, you know, the first question that it asks sort of is, you know, does does healthcare need to be fixed? Is it is it broken? And I raise that question because Cobus and I have conversations about this all the time. And he's like, no, healthcare isn't broken. He said, I've gotten phenomenal care. I'm alive because of, of healthcare. So let me just open it to you as the first question. What do you think about healthcare? Is it broken? Is it in need of saving? What do you think? Um, healthcare, the actual care is not broken. The business models are, and the, and that means some people don't get healthcare who need it. But more importantly, health is broken. That's the real problem. It's, it's not the care you get when you get care. It's the fact that you get sick in the first place when you shouldn't have had to. And it's it's more around childcare, education, employment, racism, poverty, all those things. And the healthcare system is kind of trying to fix something that it didn't break. And it's not well equipped. It's, uh, you know, so, so much disease is a response to toxic circumstances that are completely outside of the healthcare system. Can Silicon Valley save that is another big question. But the thing that really needs to play in is basically our culture and our our voters and what they vote for. We need to start seeing health as an asset that is essentially publicly owned because my health depends on your health. We need to start paying for some of these things, schools and child care and so forth and so on. And we need a culture that understands both the value of bridges, but also the value of human infrastructure. And that would seem to play into a lot of the work that you seem to be trying to address 
in what you're doing with Wellville. Is that correct? Yeah, we're trying to show what does it look like if you actually help to make a community healthy and equitable. You know, we're, we're not trying to perform miracles and we're working in real communities. We're not constructing communities. We're helping them to grow themselves. And we're, it's a 10 year project, which is too short, but it's a lot better than your usual two year initiative. So, so there are these, there are these big idea items like equity and, and, um, the things that get bucketed by social determinants and and things like that. Um, but there is this sense, at least what I experience in on the West Coast, particularly in Silicon Valley, I mean, there's a ton of money coming into companies who think that they can help and that they can solve problems. And that, and some of them are trying to solve really big problems. Some of them are solving, you know, relatively small, what I would call small point problems um, that don't address the underlying cause. But I mean, you're, you're an investor yourself. You've invested in Syllable, and so you've 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 evaluated some some companies that you think can help. What what is the role then of these of these companies, and what's the role of this money that's flowing into to these technology companies? Yeah. Well, these companies are building amazing tools, platforms, services, all of which are very useful. But in the end, the business model needs to be the public paying for a public asset rather than some rich people paying for their own health care and then a lot of poor people paying with time and anguish and huge amounts of paperwork to get reimbursed and you know no we shouldn't quote hand out health care for free but people who are ill should be cared for ideally for free and we shouldn't spend 25% or more of what the system spends simply on paperwork justifying who gets paid for what. And we're also paying for procedures rather than paying for outcomes. And, you know, so that means more procedures, not necessarily better outcomes. You get what you pay for and you get what you incentivize. I, my own sister, she's a cardiologist. She has four beautiful children. I love her. I told her about this wonderful non-invasive heart monitor that someone was pitching to me. And her first question when she heard about it was, can it be reimbursed? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> right. I don't care if it works, but can it be reimbursed? I, yeah, and, but she's got a family to feed and she's, it's like the system incentivizes that kind of invidious reaction. It does, and I mean, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. It's clearly not the most opportune question um, in regards to to technology and the application of technology. You've had experiences as a patient, and you shared some of them with with me, and I actually got to sort of participate or be a participant and part of it last year when you were looking for a primary care physician. Um, we're gonna we're gonna come back to the to the big issues around equity and inclusion and societal impacts, but. I want to I want to just sort of explore a little bit your own experiences and you know what's been exceptional um, in your experiences as a patient um, and if we are going to work on trying to improve something for us today and I think that we should um, if if what you're seeing in Wellville is a decade or two decades or three decades problem. I think that there's some things that we can do, or there needs to be some things that we could do in the shorter term that benefit us as patients as, as we're all going to be. So I'm curious about your own experiences and, and how your experiences have influenced your thinking in this area. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll give two quick stories and then we can. So one is scheduling appointments, moving them around, finding the right doctor so much of the friction in the healthcare system is just colossally stupid. It's easier to schedule a hairdresser than it is to schedule you know, a blood draw or something. It's crazy because that's not a complex problem. It's a complicated one and it's there's lots of numbers and appointments and you need to match people to doctors and so forth. It's fundamentally really simple and you you can automate it and make it human using AI and natural language like syllable. The second story was I went to see it, basically get my teeth cleaned 
a month or two ago. And, you know, very nice practice, New York City, fairly expensive, whatever. And I had this amazing dental hygienist. She was not the dentist. She explained to me what she was doing. She told me how to use a water pick. I asked her a little bit about life. And her mission was to be the very best dental hygienist she could be and to explain what she was doing to people. And she was amazing. We also undervalue people like that versus the dentist with all the credentials or the high-level surgeon. I've, I've had experiences with surgeons, and they, they basically see me as a body part, you know, whatever part they're dealing with. Whereas this dental hygienist saw me as a real person, and the difference was amazing. So the, the, the lesson in that is, I mean, it, it's a human-to-human interaction. It was an individual who had a certain set of skills, and the process of, of getting your teeth cleaned is set up so that you can be introduced to individuals like that. I'm trying to think in my own practice. I, I don't, I mean, I think the closest that I've come is I would have a series of nurse practitioners or physician assistants who, you know, if I was busy, um, would see patients on my behalf. And, you know, I had both good and bad experiences with that where patients would call me and say, I don't want to see you anymore. Your APRN is really the best person in the world and I want to see her. Like, okay, that's that's great. And then I've had the opposite experience where they're like, oh, please open up some more some more schedule hours so that that I can come see you because this individual just doesn't listen to me. But that just seems like such a, a, a basic thing. And unfortunately, it's a I would think it's exceptional because it's an exception, at least in my own experience of obtaining healthcare. Yeah, I mean it it, it is random. It's it's just like there's some amazing second grade teachers and some who barely remember the kids' names. But there's a lot more hierarchy in healthcare, and the reality is, a caring physician, or if you're black, a black physician, female, a female physician. I mean, there's, this human connection actually affects health outcomes as well. So you, you you can't dismiss it. It's not just oh the preference. It's the ability to understand what the doctor says, the ability of the doctor to understand what the patient is saying and to, to listen is so important because people forget it's not just the message that the doctor delivers, it's the instructions that the patient hears and the feeling of you know, a fair amount of health care is making the patient feel committed and, res- and responsible for doing things that the doctor or the nurse advises. And if they don't understand it or they feel the doctor doesn't respect them, they're not going to do it. Right, right. Not not out of vengeance, but just, you know, that's human nature. And then in in the work that you've done in Wellville, do you see, you, you must see the consequences of that. I mean, you, you probably see the consequences of the access issue, but for individuals that do have access, but then either don't have the wherewithal or the... Um, the resources to follow through after they manage to, to have an episode of care also must have a negative impact on the, on the community as a whole. Yeah, or I'll, I'll do the positive version. In, in Spartanburg in particular, I think it was Wofford College or some college that was training medical students developed this program called The Other 45. So the patient would be sitting in the waiting room, doctor would come, and a resident would come along with obviously the patient's permission and then the doctor would inspect the patient and write down the notes and look at the patient a few times and say blah, 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 two to blah, three a day and then the doctor would leave to take care of another patient and the resident would say okay mrs jones did you understand what he was saying and the patient would say well you know the part about three a day, was it three a day or every three day? And the resident would go through and then would say, you know, does that work for you? Do you have a refrigerator where you can keep this thing? Uh, can you afford this medicine or can we help you figure out how to get you know, some kind of state benefits that you're entitled to? Uh, is it realistic to cook this kind of food every day? And they would spend up to 45 minutes kind of explaining what the doctor said and listening to the patient's feedback about whether that made sense in the context of their lives and figuring out how to how to translate the doctor's you know, valid medical recommendations into something that the patient could understand and actually follow. 
I don't know enough to know what the outcome of that was, but I've got to believe it was amazing. And, you know, then there was in Scranton when David Feinberg came in to Geisinger. He's since been Geisinger, Google, and right. Cerner, which is being acquired by Oracle, I think it is. Uh, David said, oh, I want you to survey the community and see what they think of us. And the response was horrifying. A lot of people there felt the system disrespected them, didn't listen to them. They didn't like to go. Uh, there's a company called Higgy that has kiosks in pharmacies and places like that. And almost all healthcare skews female, but Higgy skews male because it gets the people who don't want to go and have a nurse look at them and say, hey, dude, you're kind of fat. No wonder you got to die. I mean, you might not say right. that. No, I get you know, it. You know yeah. what's going on. And so the men go to these Higgy machines and they feel more comfortable because the Higgy machine doesn't... Doesn't judge them. ...look right. at them with disdain, yeah. And, I mean, again, you see, it's not the impact of healthcare. It's the impact of bad schools, of pregnant women who don't really know how to handle kids because they're 16 and, you know, their mom is doing three shifts a day or something or, you know, and so the kids grow up with rotten teeth, bottle rot, uh, then in the schools they don't get a good education and, you know, no wonder they end up getting diabetes early or not graduating from high school. And this is you know, black and white, worse for black people, worse for poor people. And when you're poor and black, yeah, it's it's a problem that you shouldn't expect the healthcare system to solve. It can address it. But what really would solve it would be a stronger social fabric and and collectively paid for with taxes. So I appreciate that the so-called social determinants aren't necessarily a health system's responsibility to solve on their own. But I can't let my colleagues off the hook completely because they have some role. And I've seen successful roles, you know, facilitators, you know, they they connect with community, they identify the community-based organizations in their area and they ensure right. that there's connections for food, water, shelter, you know, prescription help, things like right. that. Help them find the services to which they're entitled. But I look, I look yes. at a number of inner city health systems and I always wondered, I mean, I know why they were in the areas that they were, but I saw such little impact on the blocks, on a number of the blocks surrounding some of these health systems and wondering if you're going to, if you're going to take a responsibility for a community, you take responsibility for the community that's right outside your front door. But I, I don't see that all the time. So what, what is it reasonable for, you know, if you were going to have a, if you were going to have sort of that heart to heart conversation with a inner city, or it could be a rural, um, uh, hospital slash health system CEO who was really looking for the way to the path forward to, to make an impact on their communities. How would you have that conversation and, and what would you suggest to them? I mean, I'd start with hire locally, train people, don't just lure them in with more money from somewhere else. You know, I mean, investing in people is the fundamental issue here. So invest in local people and buy your, you know, ideally buy your food locally. Don't serve apple juice with every meal as many hospitals do. Um, and be part of the community. And they should give back something to the community and they should feel part of the community and, and listen to what the community wants. Beyond that, I mean, they, you know, the burden shouldn't be on the health system alone. It should be on not, I mean, given zoning, given historical segregation, giving all those things, it's not the community should pay for everything. The broader community, whether it's state or federal funds, should be paying for the next generation of people to be, to not be damaged before they hit five or 10 right. years old. And so the healthcare system is a part of that, and it certainly has a part in 
supporting local community organizations and working with them rather than competing with them or feeling threatened by them. But, you know, what Silicon Valley really can save is making the healthcare system itself more effective. But it can also, I mean, the exciting thing now, we, we talked about, you know, the stupid problems of scheduling, but then there are the, the hard problems of, for example, proving that if you, if you change the diet of the community 10 years later, you, you have both what happened, which is I've got to believe they get somewhat healthier, and the counterfactual, which is that they stay unhealthy. And using AI to kind of do these models and look at the counterfactuals and say, okay, we should attribute 20% of this improvement to the grocery chains that started selling healthy food and another 20% to the sidewalks and the bicycle company that came in and everybody's now biking around and being healthy. And so there's a lot of really interesting stuff to do with data modeling. And then there's all the, just make the thing more efficient so that when you send a document to your doctor, they don't say, and you call another doctor who actually operates in the same system in the same building, they don't say, oh, we can't get that because that's in their system. And we're, I mean, this, this happened in a case where somebody acquired somebody else, but they were both using the same Epic system, but they had different accounts. And so they couldn't share information, right. which is nuts. It's, it, it's absolute nuts. Not to mention the whole issue around fax machines. And the fact that millennials have no idea what a fax machine is, but yet every doctor's office still has one. Yeah, and you, I sat in a doctor's office last year, and for an hour, this woman was on the phone trying to get somebody to fax or something. Um, because of your introduction to syllable to me to of me to syllable, I've learned a lot about something I knew nothing before I I started this journey, which was the whole. Um, venture investing industry and venture capital. And I am, I am not sure. I haven't, I'm, I haven't solidified my thinking in terms of whether it's a good model or it's a bad model. And I guess what I want to ask you is, I loved what you said about let's, let's use technology to ask and answer really good questions that will have an impact on a, on a, on a community. I don't see a lot of those companies getting funded. And I wonder if the process around funding healthcare technology is really about creating a product or is it more about being a wealth creation vehicle? Yeah, it's about creating a company that can be right. sold. And then Silicon Valley, you have people who want to build companies to solve problems and you have investors who want to build companies to sell them. And again, they're, they're searching for relief. I got to, I got to do another one next quarter or the partners are going to, you know, I will get less than my fair share and the partners are going to take more. And so you, you get this addiction to short term gains and basically sell the company while it's still on the upswing <laughs> rather than hitting right. reality. And the, the best description I've heard, and then I'll... So Zephyr Teachout, who wrote this book, Break Him Up, and ran for attorney general and governor in New York. Profits in a business are like sex in a marriage. They are important to the sustainability of the enterprise. And they're, you know, good. And they're sort of a fundamental part of the package. But more sex and more profits don't necessarily make a better marriage or mm -hmm. a better business. And we need to understand that you know, everything works on a spectrum. It's not absolute. No, more sex is not better. More profits, more alcohol. Alcohol is nice. It's a social lubricant. And people who are searching for relief and not getting it keep trying and trying and trying. And it's Mark makes that wonderful distinction between the pleasure that you used to have and then the craving for the pleasure you can no longer achieve because you become dependent on the thing and it, it no longer relieves your eyes. So I think I remember you saying at one point in time about Wellville that one of the models that you were sort of thinking about in your head with Wellville is to try to create community investment opportunities for 
people like yourself where and, and other people who had disposable income that would want to invest and get a return. And if I remember correctly, the thought process was, you know, part of the Wellville mission was to create an infrastructure that would provide the expertise and the resources to sort of take money, create opportunity that, and then would lift the, the, the community and return a rate to the original investors. Am, am I misrem- misremembering that or? You're probably remembering it right. That's no longer part of, I mean, the reality is that's a good thing and it happens occasionally, but I mean, the first thing we, maybe not the first thing, but one important thing we learned in Wellville is, yeah, I, I would tell people immediately, no, it's not a nice white lady showing up with high tech to help the poor people. But it's not even, we, we don't even come in with programs. We're, we obviously have opinions about whether something makes sense or not. But fundamentally, we're trying to help the community do what it's doing and do it better. In Muskegon, there is indeed an opportunity zone. And I'm trying to help them precisely build things that are investable and, and so forth and so on. But it's, it's more... If you help the people in the community do what they do and be successful, that spreads. It's contagious. If you help people who are not going to succeed, you you just keep sinking money into something that doesn't work. And so just like an investor, you you pick something that's going to work, and then you hope it works better if you're a good investor. If you're a sleazy investor, you pour money into it and then sell it to the next person before they notice that. Right. Right. It's not really right. working. Um, like these outfits that are now losing $20 a throw delivering no. groceries. Makes no sense. It's it crazy. is. Absolutely. I mean, in, in the end, these communities need to produce something and export and not just, you know, in most of these communities, the healthcare system is one of the biggest employers and it's the biggest producer, at least, of profits. Uh, most of the value is devoted to fixing problems that shouldn't have happened in the first place. If you could invest in schools and parks and things instead of that, you wouldn't need so much health care and you'd have a lot healthier people and you could start. Most of our communities had a thriving middle class that kind of disappeared when the industrial fabric fell apart. Well, we're sort of coming down to the end of our hour, and I want to be respectful, but I, I have a couple of sort of, um, I guess I'll call them rapid fire questions just to throw at you if that's okay. Um, I was doing some Esther Dyson research before we thought about inviting you, and I found some some old stuff from Release 1.0 that I don't know if you actually wrote it or you you edited it, but there's something here, particularly that with what we do at, at Syllable, that I thought was it was really prescient. So. If I, if you'll indulge me, I want to read it to you for a second, and then and then get you to um, to respond to it. And the quote was: "Enough innovation goes the cry. How do we get value out of all of this stuff? How can we render existing data accessible to our own users and third parties? In an increasingly automated world, the links amongst the automated parts are still clumsy, rudimentary, low bandwidth, unautomated. Those links." Are people, and that was 1986. That probably is me. I, if you tell me the month, I it can was. Look it up and uh, tell I'll you. tell you the day, May 29th, 1986, and the okay. title was "Retrofit Technology: Innovation Around Obsolescence." And it just seems so right on if you wrote it today. Yeah. Which is scary. This is very scary. And that's and that's before. I mean, if you think in. 2021, if you just look at digital health, the amount of money invested in digital health exceeded $20 billion last year. And how much money has been spent since 1986? It's, I don't think we've, we've solved that particular problem, do you? The bricks grew better. The mortar is still not quite caught up. Very true. Um, something else you wrote. Um, to educate, and you taught me this word, to educate and give people agency are huge investments in reducing crime, healthcare costs, and overall making this a better country. Can you talk for a minute about the notion of agency and why it's so important? Yeah. And in fact, I'll I'll tell you something we're doing right now in Muskegon, which is, I confess, one of the few things that's really more my idea, but it it got really enthusiastic take up. So it's 
it's sort of a a research study that you know has an IRB and has a principal investigator who's Dr. Ramona Wallace, who used to work for Muskegon Family Care in Muskegon and is now living nearby and eager to be part of the community again. And the host organization is the Boys and Girls Club, just to make it all. And it's basically a class of teenagers who are going to be wearing aura rings and learning about their sleep. And it's, it's sort of a human physiology class being taught by Dr. Wallace and two interns. It came about because I was at a boys and at the Boys and Girls Club watching, you know, in one room kids were doing book reports to one another and everybody's listening, it was fascinating. In another they were doing art projects. And in the third they were watching a healthcare video and so it was right. falling asleep. And afterwards I asked you know, something like, Well, why is cancer bad? Nobody could really answer. I mean, they, I, they, they weren't, you know, they were smart kids. I'm sure they knew, right. but they didn't feel, having watched this, that they could explain it. And I thought, there's got to be a better way. So we're teaching them. Originally, we were going to use CGMs, but that ended up being too complicated for a bunch of reasons. They're invasive and so forth. Uh, they're going to learn about metabolism, but they're also going to learn about the metabolism of the food system, which is running on money, the way they run on sugar and other nutrients. And of course we had to do the IRB and we had to explain the study. And the, the outcome of the study is not these kids lose weight. I mean, there's because our country is so unhealthy, it, it's assumed everybody wants to lose weight. But no, you know, we should be a country where people don't want or need to right. lose weight. And they're still kids. Some of them probably would do better weighing a bit less, but the primary outcome that to be measured is a sense of agency because ultimately we want these kids to know this is how your body works. And if you want to change, you know enough to do that, but we're not here to bully you and make you change. We're not, we're not going to grade you on losing weight. We're not even going to grade you on hours of sleep, but we want you to feel that it's in your power, that you control your body. You may not control your circumstances or your parents or your neighbors, but you know how this thing works and you know what to do to change. That sense of agency is so important to feeling useful, to feeling in control and to, again, knowing you can't predict the future, but you can manage your own reaction to it. Do you see do you see that as a building block within these communities that you're working, where you teach agency? You know, it's 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 giving somebody a fish, teaching them to fish. You know, giving somebody agency, teaching them about agency, and then giving them an opportunity to express something positive from that agent. Is that is that yeah. community building? Is that a force multiplier in these in these communities? Well, it's it's totally wonderful, but you know, it's not like you go onto a city bus and you start lecturing people. I want to give you a sense right, of agency. Right. Uh, and our work in particular, I mean, I'm not the right person to be talking to most community members and, and inspiring their trust. We've been there now for seven years, and finally the people we work with directly are beginning to trust us. But they need that from their own community. And so we like to say we're not giving the fish, we're not even teaching them to fish. We're helping the we're helping the people we work with to build their own fishing academies. And that becomes sustainable because right. then that persists and the academies keep producing new people with sense of agency who can somehow pass it on to others. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If this is your first time hearing Esther, that is what you get when she talks a no-nonsense approach to big problems backed up by decades of trying out different solutions, mixed with a real awe and joy of technology, and a real sense of human-to-human -human connection. What I took away from this conversation was that despite her interest in investing in health tech companies, she focuses her current work on the fact that health is fundamentally about people, helping people, and that these are decades problems, not next quarter's problems. 
Anyway, if you found this episode interesting, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe. And stay tuned for more episodes of Can Silicon Valley Save Healthcare? Thanks a lot for listening.